Hello there, and welcome back to the Disc Connected. I'm here with Chris O'Neill, who is a filmmaker, video essayist, uh, contributor, and um, even uh, like video editor from what I've seen for some of these companies lately. Is that right? Yeah, I've uh, apart from the video essays, I do trailers as well. Um, but I've also done, uh, in one instance, I, I actually edited like a, a an interview featurette uh, on the Radio On disc for Fun City Editions. Yeah. So um, I've dabbled in a bunch of different kind of areas. Uh, so yeah, I guess I could say I'm an editor. <laughs> We, uh, we'll, we will get into all of the nitty-gritty details in just a few minutes, of course. But uh, the main thing I really wanted to point out first is just the wide variety of stuff that you've covered. So there's going to be a lot that we can discuss today. You're not really uh, hooked to one genre. And then on top of that, you've, you've not really been doing a lot of the video essays for a super long time. But even then, your name is kind of everywhere at the moment. You, you've been hitting a lot of companies really hard. How's, uh, how's the last couple of years been for you? Well... I, I edited my first video essay in July of 2020, and I worked out within about two and a half years, uh, I did 35 video essays, plus I did an audio commentary, plus I edited a, an interview featurette, and I've done trailers as well. So... Uh, it's not like it came from nowhere. It's kind of interesting. I used to do a lot of film writing online and magazines right. and things. And also I'm a filmmaker. Do, I do a lot of experimental films, short films, that kind of thing. Often using footage from pre-existing works. So uh, yes. when uh, Jonathan at uh, Fun City Editions contacted me saying, would you be interested in a video essay? He saw it as, well, you do this and you do that. Well, why don't you just blend them together? And I was like, yeah. I've never thought of that before. And uh, suddenly once I did one or two or three, I, I hit the ground running. And uh, I think I've worked with about 15 different labels now um, <laughs> in that time. Uh, doing all these kind of things. So, uh, yeah, and, and sometimes it's when they reach out to me to ask. Sometimes it was me chasing if I've heard they have a particular title, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, in a, in a very short amount of time, like I said, two and a half years, 35 uh, video essays, uh, I can't believe it myself. Uh, but it's worth noting that a lot of that time was during the pandemic when right. um, I had nothing else going on. So that <laughs> helped. <laughs> Uh, I will have everything linked down in the description below. And one of the things is going to be your Vimeo because a lot of the stuff that you've worked on is on your personal Vimeo. And we haven't talked about this beforehand, but I, I've binged through as much of it as I possibly could and really enjoyed your style. And a lot of the way that you communicate with people that you know are going to be watching these, these essays or these uh, experimental films I, I don't know. It's a really interesting way to get your personality across. And with experimental films and this unique texture, it just shows the, I, I guess, really careful touch of a filmmaker that will put out something like you have. I, I've really enjoyed everything that you've put out there. Uh, thank you. That's very nice to hear because um, when you're making experimental film and when you're making video essays and you're very much working within it, a bubble to some extent, you know, I mean, when you're making movies with other people, you've got cast and crew and, you know, there's, there's different elements along the way, but when you're working with things that are much more, uh, based on footage that pre-exists or, uh, experimenting with, with techniques and layers and textures and all kinds of things, uh, you're, you're doing it all on your own. And in, yeah. in your own little bubble, and uh, you don't always know what people think about them, which is why sometimes it's nice to read uh, reviews of video essays and things and stuff I've done online. But to hear uh, that people uh, appreciate the a lot of a lot of different aspects of my work, it's 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 nice to hear, you know. So thank you. Well, you've got an absolutely lovely voice for it, so I wanted to highlight that. But the other thing, uh, you're only the second one that I've been able to say this to, is congrats on that Shelf Shock Rewind Award for uh, Out of the Blue for the video essay that was out last year. And honestly, the other one was Amanda, because I just uh, talked to her a few months ago. 
I've seen that interview. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoy anything with Amanda. She's great to, to listen to. But thank you. Um, that video essay was an int- it was interesting how that one came around. What happened was yeah. um, it was originally I was I originally reached out to the people behind the restoration of the film, saying could I do something. And uh, by the time it got picked up for distribution in the UK by the British Film Institute, uh, the video essay just hadn't worked. But the, but the British right. Film Institute had heard I was in, was going to do one. And they said, well, would you like to? Because we've got a lot of content that's based on Dennis Hopper. It'd be nice to have something uh, that is specific to Linda Manns. And the deadline was short by then between needing to have it finished. But also I had just done one on Linda Mann's for uh, the Days of Heaven disc uh, the imprint put out in Australia so I kind of was like I really want to do this but I I just felt like I wasn't in the right place to do it at that time with the, te- the deadline and other projects and things so I had already worked with Amanda on an es- a video essay that she asked me to work on for her uh, the toolbox murders which I think is an incredible video essay i I don't mean because i'm involved i mean because of uh what amanda um right what amanda brought to it you know i i I just tried to illustrate what she wanted to to get across her point but uh so i asked her would she like to contribute to this one and and she did and i'm delighted she did i think it works out really well and again that's not praise me self-praise that that, that's me talking about amanda's work so uh yeah thank you i i I, i'm really proud of that and then it was great that it was on the severin disc as well so um yeah it was was, uh it was great to work on and and great um, to have that award (laughs) it's an astounding release uh both the bfi and the severin release they're incredible and then to see this film finally getting discovered by so many people is just fascinating i I love seeing it spread like wildfire lately and uh i think i was able to mention it to amanda by the time that i talked to her but i got to see it in uh my local theater this year they brought the restoration to our one of the the nice little art house theaters that we have and seeing that in a a room that was literally probably 85 percent full of people that had uh, probably most of them had seen it before, but a handful that were just discovering it for the first time and really watching them just be bowled over by the emotional beats. It, it was such a great, great theater experience. Oh, uh, yeah. No, it's a great film. I first saw it when I was 16 or 17. Wow. And uh, I was in rural Ireland, in a small town in Ireland. So a lot of the the beats about where they were in that story, um, right. I could relate to not specifically with what was going on with the characters and things but that um you know that lifestyle small town kind of uh yeah so it it really hit me hard but um yeah i mean it, it has to be one of the most you know excuse the language what the fuck openings ever yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like if that's the opening where's this film going right and <laughs> you know? the funny thing is the way they set up the opening it really mirrors the ending kind of beautifully mm. they, they do it really really well and my, uh, my wife had never seen it before this year so to watch it with her for the first time i loved that she couldn't shut up about it for the next probably day and a half because she was just completely awestruck by it yeah oh yeah i mean i'm i'm a, I'm a big fan of uh dennis hopper as a director um I mean, the last movie is one of my favorite movies, but yeah. I'd have to tie it between the two films that would be my favorite films that Hopper directed would be the last movie and Out of the Blue. They're both very different in, in, in certain yeah. ways. Obviously, I think the last movie is much more experimental. Um, but the fact that Out of the Blue hangs together so well when you hear about how turbulent the production was, yeah. I mean, it just, <laughs> just, it's, it's just it just comes together absolutely perfectly. Like you wouldn't think there was anything like that behind the scenes. It just seems so perfect, you know? So yeah, yeah, it's a wonderful movie. I agree. Uh, so getting into what you've done, uh, you've done all kinds of experimental films. Um, first thing I'd love to throw out there is what are the main inspirations behind those other than what you've taken from the, the pre-existing footage? Cause it's, it's not every day that we get access to, you know, genuine experimental films. You get a, a few people that are, uh, you know, doing shorts that are, you know, a little avant-garde, but truly like experimental. I, I'm seeing into someone's soul with this. It's that's not as common. 
Yeah, I mean, in terms of influences, it's 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 really interesting because with experimental cinema, obviously this is a very broad um, just way of putting it, but it tends to yeah. be kind of almost like two um, schools of thought from it, which is where it's coming from an artist who moves into moving image or a filmmaker who's going into the avant-garde. Does, does that make any right. sense? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, um, I'm obviously coming from it from a, a cinema point of view and deconstructing cinema. And it comes from a fascination of, I used to find myself watching a movie and there would be one particular actor for example, that I would just fascinate, find fascinating, and I would just fixate on. Uh, a very recent example would be The Hateful Eight. It's an okay movie; I enjoyed it, but I absolutely adored Jennifer Jason Leigh's performance in it. Mm. And I found myself watching her, and there are scenes in that film where she's doing nothing, yet she's doing something. If, right. if, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. It's such an amazing performance. And I like often focusing on performances by people, but performances in regards to screen presence and body language. So, uh, for example, there's one I've done that's uh, from a, a tatty old 16 millimeter print of uh, the 1975 thriller Russian Roulette mm -hmm. and uh, Christina Raines who is an incredibly underrated actress I, I think she's great I just chose all the scenes with her in real too so I projected this 16 mil print that had turned all red mm -hmm. and I just filmed all the scenes with her and I made this kind of crazy thing where uh she's a secondary character in the film, but I make it about just her scenes, which gives it this weird quality of it being like this strange office based, uh, surreal drama or something where like there's telex is coming through and fax <laughs> machines and other office workers and her walking around and her answering the phone or her getting out of bed, answering the phone. So, um, that's what I like to do. And uh, in terms of influences, I, on I honestly don't know in terms of other filmmakers. And that's not me saying it. I'm not influenced. I obviously am. Right. Uh, I mean, one of my favorite filmmakers is someone who would be considered incredibly experimental, which would be Nicholas Rogue. Mm. Uh, I'm absolutely obsessed with him. Uh, you know, one of my favorite movies is Kenneth Anger's uh, Scorpio Rising. I, I love that movie. Uh, but in terms of people who specifically influenced me, I honestly couldn't tell you. And I think when it comes to my experimental work, I purposely leave it that way because uh, I like to explore pre-existing maybe narrative cinema and right. do something quirky with it without, without actually thinking of, I want to do it like this filmmaker did, or I want to do it like that filmmaker. Now don't get me wrong. I'm sure someone could watch one of my films and go, I could name 10 filmmakers who's done something <laughs> similar or 20 right. or 30. And they're probably right, but it's not where I'm coming at, you know, but that's what I think you can say with all art forms, of course, you know, yeah. it's like how many, how many stories are written and or how many movies are made where it's essentially the same plots over and over again, but it's hopefully how someone uh, executes them that makes them worthwhile or different, you know? And funny enough, uh, I was going to make a, a similar sort of observation about a lot of your visual essays because they they seem to be this singular force that have this really unique background between every single one where it's very educational but somehow has this magnetic approach that no matter what the topic is – and there's, there's a wide variety of topics you've covered on these visual essays and it's not like – uh, somebody could say, I, I'm i going to listen to all of Chris O'Neill's visual essays because I love this filmmaker or I love this film style because there's so many across the board. But each and every one, I've started it and it's, well, okay, I'm hunkering down because I'm probably going to have to watch this twice because I'm going to take notes. There, there's some amazing stuff in here. I, I've i loved so much of, of your essays. And I just as somebody that is aspiring to be 
basically what you're doing is there a, a certain approach that you try to take with each of these essays because they are they're astounding well, well thank you first um it's always nice to hear things like that um in terms of approach honestly it depends on the material because some video essays um focus just on the material you're looking at and then some have actual historical context added to them you know i mean for example one of my earliest ones was the uh canon film new year's evil that was on the aa films disc yeah and in that i tried to go into the release pattern of the film how it came out in the states things like that when i did a, a video essay on uh trancers uh, which is one of my favorite movies, the Charles Band film. Uh, I went into all the different uh, movies that it played with in the UK and British cinemas when it was a double, when it was on double bills. You know, so sometimes nice. you do that kind of research. But then for something like, say, my video essay on I Start Counting, that just focused on the movie and the story and the character that's one of my favorite yeah. essays to be honest because it just it's this wonderful coming of age drama slash like psycho thriller yeah. <laughs> you know it has these two kind of things going on but i always saw it as a character study and a, and a coming of age drama and i really find some of that film really heartbreaking and touching it really gets to me some of it it really gets quite i get quite emotional watching it so in regards to uh you know, a, it, it depends on which film I'm watching and how it works, you know, like something that's, uh, also how I make them varies as well. Sometimes I will just record a voiceover, have it completely, re you know, done or get someone else to record the voiceover or I record the voiceover, whatever it is. And then to that edit images, or sometimes what I do and it, it depends purely on what you're working with is I'll record a bit of voiceover edit footage, then see where the, where it's going with the footage, seeing how things play out, seeing where it would be a nice scene to put in after that right. piece of information and then record a bit more and then edit and record a bit more. Now, obviously that's very painstaking and it's quite torturous at times, but sometimes it just feels like the right way of doing it you know so See, there's no real I'm sorry i, I was going to point out is that it seems like that's where the experimental film really the the backgrounds there really kind of shine for you because it seems like it would be a similar process you've got that pre-existing footage you don't necessarily know where it's going you're you're fixating on something and then as it carries on maybe it's telling a different story by the time you're done yeah i mean, i i think that's a you know what you've picked up on there is is probably right you know um yeah i i i, I agree uh, and i'm not saying that's in yes i agree that's what i do with my art i mean going <laughs> yeah gee yeah you're probably right yeah okay <laughs> i i love that and i i mean the the i don't even know how to word it a, a lot of the stuff that you've done is so so varied and a lot of these people that contribute to these essays they have these very niche specialties like somebody will always talk about animal attacks films somebody will always talk about giallos whatever but i mean even if if we only talk about uh releases on the vinegar syndrome website the the wide variety of stuff you've covered i mean all, so many of the fun city edition stuff uh you're on the sensor disc you're on the undefeatable disc that just came out uh, the Lux Eterna visual essay. Uh, and then just recently you were on um, Please Baby Please from Music Box, uh, Burning Paradise, Bio Zombie. There's so many that, like, these don't really go together. And yet somehow you find something to love in every single one that's educational and just lovely. I, it's it's a gift, man. You're, you're doing great. Well, thanks. I mean, besides being uh, a filmmaker and a writer, I'm also a cinema programmer. Like, I worked out recently... Yeah. I worked out, I've been a cinema programmer for 19 years. Wow. So I started when I was in my early 20s. And um, 
and, and even before that, in, in my teens, uh, obsessed with film and had a very sort of a encyclopedic knowledge. Uh, right. Not so much in the last couple of years anymore. Now I have two kids. <laughs> uh, like anything, that, <laughs> stuff doesn't <laughs> doesn't stay in the brain as much as it used to. But um, due, due to lack of sleep and other uh, you know uh, things to to think about and worry about. But um, but in regards to uh, studying different films and looking at them and thinking about an audience for them and also having this weird practical quality to them as well because uh like i, I so i program art house cinemas and art house cinema is is contradiction in terms art right. is creativity and cinema is money you know so it's sometimes trying to find this balance between uh commerce and uh artistic vision you know so I, I I tend to find when I'm doing these video essays that uh, on one hand I'm trying to be creative and I'm trying to uh, either give some sort of knowledge or some sort of uh, angle for someone to think about differently on the film or whatever. But I also try to do it in a very uh, practical uh, way that's right. very... Um, very linear you know i mean I, I joke about it but i i i, I joke that I, I like to think of myself whether it's experimental cinema or my video essays that i'm like uh, like i'm trying to do it like a don siegel film or something or like <laughs> one of those or one of those uh you know four reeler new world pictures films or uh, or charles band you know a strange analogy to make but it's that same kind of mindset of trying to get everything very con concise and yeah condensed and worthwhile at the same time you know yeah that that's very true and i mean the the idea of film programming first of all we we don't highlight that as an art form in itself enough because there's so much thought that has to go into some of these because not only are you you know curating for really what you want to see but also you're you're supplying art to an entire community and the the entire mood of a night or a weekend or uh, you know, the ability to change somebody's life with discovering some of these films goes a long way. And truly choosing what to make some of these essays about is kind of curating in that same way. Because, you know, in, in Lux Eterna, obviously the, the idea of this film being in split screen, it's important to the film. And, and you could stop there and really highlight it from that. But highlighting all split screen cinema and the way that this has been done is, you know, there's so many different unique approaches that you could take and you've you've made some great choices along the way um is there a certain video essay that you've done that you're just very very proud of and you think might be like the most impactful one for you looking back on well i have some favorites and i have certain films that mean something mm -hmm. but i think the one at the moment that i'm most proud of partially because i just can't believe i did it <laughs> 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 in a very short amount of time and everything and, and how well it, it I think it came out myself I mean, I'd like to think it came out well is the one on the sensor uh, mm. disc um, Freedom is the Image about the history of the origins of the video nasties uh, yeah. phenomena in Britain I'm really proud of that one uh, because I mean that one's like my longest one as well I think it's like 30 is it 33 minutes I think and um Honestly, I just sat down, wrote it in a couple of days, and it was it was all just there, you know, a bit of tweaking and a bit of editing, but it just came through because um, it's a fascinating subject on several levels. Yeah, you have um, the films in question are are fun or or movies that I admire or enjoy or love or whatever. But it's also this idea that people found them dangerous. That's <laughs> yeah. really fascinating. And what I found it really interesting in the research I did was there's all, there was obviously a media campaign with the newspaper, tabloid newspapers and oh, broadsheets, every, everyone really, to, right. to get these things banned because they're harmful to our children. Was when you're reading some of these reports on one hand they're giving a catalogue of these are the horrible scenes in the films that's one thing but when you actually start reading little insinuations about 
the films that aren't there, which make them sound even worse. Right. For example, when they're talking about the the film Snuff, one article, one newspaper article said something like, even though it was disproven to be real by the FBI, some still believe that isn't the case. Which was obviously complete nonsense. But by putting right. that in there, people thought, oh my God, real death is in these movies. Real yeah. torture, you know? Or another one detailing what was happening in I Spit in Your Grave. Now, that's that, that's extreme in one hand, the, the content of the film itself. And like, here we are, uh, how many how many years old is that film now? Is it 35 years? 40, 45 years now? Somewhere around 45, yeah. Must be 45 years? It's still contentious. I mean, even oh, as yeah. of like 10 or 15 years ago, where I'm here in Ireland, the film was banned again, even in a heavily cut Jeez. form. You know, so it still rubs people up the wrong way. But one article stated that uh, the main character was... Uh, an underage girl, which she isn't in the film. You know, she's right. she's a she's a grown woman. But by putting that little detail in there, that just makes it even sound even more disturbing and not right. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. So it was, it, yeah. So the, it was it was reading these different media reports and the salacious language they'd use, and on one hand saying, "Aren't these things horrible?" while printing images from the video covers and things like that. <laughs> so it was like on one hand, people were reading them saying these are disgusting, yet they're looking at them and reading these catalog of disgusting things that are happening. You know, dying to see more of it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so so it was really about the the way the media manipulated these things, but also the film companies themselves had their own uh, had their own um, they, they had to take they, they had to accept responsibility for some of what they were doing. Well, they weren't right. just putting the movies out, but they had these wonderfully lurid box art covers where you know they wanted someone to walk into a video shop and go. Jesus, what's that? I want to rent that. You know, right. I mean, if you look at, you think of Driller Killer. I mean, it's like uh, Abel Ferrara's Driller Killer is more like a Polanski film, really. <laughs> and there's a couple of instances of very, you know, a couple of seconds of gore here and there, but overall, right. it, it, it's quite restrained. It's but by yeah. taking, yeah, but by taking the image of the drill going into the head and having that on the front cover of the box, that film became like the poster boy for uh, why these films are horrible and why they need to be banned, right. you know? So anyway, uh, all of that going into um, this video essay uh, was, was really interesting for me. Uh, and also uh, someone I, I admire quite greatly said they saw it and said it, they thought it was the best audio visual piece they've seen about the video nasties, which, which was really quite humbling to me. Because uh, I've seen, I mean, for example, David Gregory made an absolutely amazing yep. two-part documentary, Band the Sadist Videos, which which is one of my favorite documentaries. Jake West as well did the, the great two-part documentary as well. Th those documentaries are amazing and they should be checked out. But for someone to say that they, they really liked mine and the fact that mine found some sort of angle that wasn't covered in those ones or rather it probably was covered but it's just i just found a different uh cockeyed kind of side view of looking at some of the aspects that weren't quite right. covered the same way i should say in those documentaries um you know it was quite humbling and i was happy that someone got something out of it so um, i'm really proud of that that video essay but like i said i've done 34 other ones <laughs> so yeah. um you know i mean i start counting as a personal favorite um, I'm really proud of the Out of the Blue one and the Toolbox Murders one. Uh, the, both of those I did with Amanda Reyes. Uh, Morvin Caller video essay. I, 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 it's just one of my favorite movies, so that was really yeah. something to do. Um, and one other one that just come to mind is the Year of the Dragon video essay I did for the imprint release of that movie because it was nice to basically the whole video essay was about 20 minutes long and it was defending Ariane's performance in that movie because she got dragged over the, you know, got dragged over the coals for that movie. I mean, her career yeah. ended once it started in terms of being an actress, but I think she's great in that film. You know, in my 20 minute video essay was basically defending her performance in that movie. So, um, I'd, you know, I'd love to, I'd, 
whether she would like it or not, I don't know. But I'd love to to get it to a copy to her, just to sort of say, you know, you you did a great job because right. you know she did, you know. But anyway, but I'm sure I'm blanking right now. Like in in ten minutes, time I go, oh, and there was this other one. But you know, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, imprint, I think, kind of deserves a special little side round of applause for a moment because I've been I've been really pleased with how they've been uh, moving towards and fairly supportive their their entire run about contextual extras because in a lot of instances some of these films would go with nothing on any other company or they'd get a couple old archival interviews and say yeah that's a great release let's throw it out there imprint has been first off steadily increasing the number of things that they're putting on discs but on top of that very supportive of uh, you and Kat Ellinger and Daniel Kramer and, uh, you know, all of these other people that are jumping on some of these releases like Howard S. Berger and giving them free reign, it, it looks like, at least from the outside, to say, what do you want to talk about about this film or relate to this film? You'll get something like, uh, you know, Kat Ellinger defending Nastasia Kinski and saying, you know, she's she deserves a lot more credit than she got or what you're talking about right now on The, the Last Dragon. Yeah. There's so many of these extras that you've never heard from somebody before because a film will get taken out of context and not delivered with that educational approach. So yeah, I, I imprint, I feel like deserves a lot more credit than they've gotten. Yeah. No, they've, they've been coming out with some great stuff, you know, I yeah. mean, um, I mean, I'm proud of the ones I've, I've worked on with them, but, uh, they've just done so many releases. And <laughs> as you say, there is a lot of interesting, uh, extras that contextualize the works and i think contextualizing cinema is very important because there's all kinds of aspects that that i think um are worth looking at for example sometimes it could be contextualizing the uh release of a film or or the time period of the film or uh yeah. where the filmmaker was coming from what kind of what was politically going on at the time that kind of right. thing you know and then there's also just studying the film and, and coming up with different aspects or you know a defense of certain actors or whatever and and there's some amazing box sets coming out as well i can't keep up with them they just it's every month many. they seem to be <laughs> announcing stuff yeah and um you know, unfortunately, uh, importing from Australia is not cheap. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's gotten bad. Um, yeah. I mean, all over the world, it seems shipping costs and, and things have just gone through the roof. But no, they, they do some great work. And uh, I, I still do a lot of trailers for them recently. I just did one recently for Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. I'm not involved on the disc, but um, that disc has, I mean, I've, I've done the trailer. I'm not involved on any of the extras on the disc, right. but um, like, that disc has some great stuff on it. I'm really looking forward to seeing that myself. I mean, it's a film that's already been on uh, Blu-ray. I had the Twilight Time disc, and then there was a great Arrow edition. But the fact that that Arrow edition had so much on it, and then Imprint could come up with another disc which has right. so much on it, you know, <laughs> it is really testament to what they're doing. You know, that that it's worth owning both of those the releases, the Arrow and the Imprint release. You know, uh, one more thing that I really wanted to highlight is through the way that you communicate and the things that you seem to focus on, not only in the essays, but what I feel through the experimental film. Uh, and then what you post on social media, a lot of your life seems to be very musical. Uh, it seems like you've got this, this great passion for music and have been attached to it for a long time. And I don't know if that's uh, evident to everybody or if it's just me, because it's been such a big part for me, but uh, has, has music played a, a big part in your life? Cause it certainly feels like it. Uh, yes it does uh ab yeah absolutely sorry i just never thought of that before um because uh yes it does i mean w i mean a lot of my video essays um are scored by a collaborator i work with called gabby bam bam uh stage name <laughs> and uh like she's absolutely incredible yeah and what makes her so unique i i found in terms of working with her is I will show her the film I'm working on a video essay for, and she'll give me a musical interpretation of that film, you know? That's so 
uh, I mean, Alphabet City was the very first one we ever did together. Then we did I Start Counting, uh, Jeremy, uh, Year of the Dragon, uh, the Luxa Turner, uh, the split screen video essay. And uh, I don't always use pre-recorded, you know, uh, especially recorded scores. Sometimes I just right. work with the materials of the film. Uh, but yeah, sorry. I just, uh, it sounds like if I'm not really an- answering the question, it's, it's not that, uh, uh, I, I, um, I don't agree. I, I just never thought of it. I suppose I do I have uh, quite a passion for, <laughs> for music. Well, funnily enough, uh, like, when I get to do them, I don't know, but I keep saying when I have downtime, you know, maybe in 10 years time, uh, when I have downtime, I'd love to do a series of online video essays where it's just for the fun of it. I will select subjects where I will do some just to run, you know, and one I would love to do, for example, is focus on maybe sometimes a music video or even a song. I mean, uh, I recently saw Polk live and one of my favorite songs of all time, one of my favorite albums, one of my favorite songs, and it has a great music video, is This Is Hardcore, that album and and the the title track. And I actually wanted to do a video essay where I uh, discuss the music video. But of course, when you're discussing, if you're doing a video essay on a song, you have to be careful because it's also (laughs) copyright as well. (laughs) So I had this crazy idea where it's like can i break down the song without using any of the song right. <laughs> just using the music video uh highlighting the lyrics having some sort of score created for it that somehow is uh, a tribute to the to the video and the, and the song yet probably doesn't sound anything like it you know and this is just and this sounds crazy and it probably sounds a bit pointless but these are the things that are going through my head sometimes like laying there at night going yeah i'd really love to do a video essay on 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 a music video but not use any of the music Hmm. you know so funny enough uh, i've had a lot of the same thoughts i've uh, i grew up kind of adjacent to the music industry i i did show promotions for a long time i've had bands play my living room a handful of times Uh, i've even been in a a few different music videos and the the amount of times that i've gone through on imdb and been researching for a director and you get through you know 1989 and then the next seven entries are all music videos and you're like wait a minute, this makes perfect sense. I watched that thing so many times and you can tell it's the exact same filmmaker because he takes a lot of the same sentimentalities and applies it to those. And, and I, I could see a really great piece being on those. Yeah, no, I mean, music, I've done, I've done five or six music videos myself now. And, um, you know, one thing I tend to have in a lot of my experimental films and it's been in the music videos is, is, uh, female portraits <laughs> just female faces mm-hmm. and uh it's interesting to uh because also I, I quite like the sometimes uncomfortableness maybe but also the intimacy of someone looking into camera right and looking straight into the audience i think there's something really uh uncomfortable in some circumstances but also really emotional and intimate as well and that's one great thing you could do with a music video because they're uh, a musician is performing the song yeah to an audience and therefore to camera so sometimes a video uh, sorry some of the music videos can be an extension of that as well and um yeah uh and I mean, also one of my one of my favorite filmmakers is Toby Hooper, and I only f- I only found out in the recent years that he directed the video for um, Dancing with Myself by Billy Idol, mm-hmm. you know. And I've seen that video before, and of course, the one thing that is uh, frustrating but understandable is when you were watching VH1 or MTV or whatever, they never gave the director credit. Never, you know. So, and then years later. You, you, it's like you find out all these amazing auteur directors or whoever yep. directed music videos or sometimes like TV commercials. Yeah. You know, and you're like, wow, okay. Like I, I discovered um, one or two uh, commercials recently and, uh, oh, that's Tony Scott. 
I, okay, I can see that. Or uh, Nicholas Rogue, he did right. a few. Oh, okay, you know, and um, yeah, so it, it, it could be fascinating jo- joining the dots once you know that, you know, with these different filmmakers and sensibilities. And, and uh, uh, sometimes you can just drive yourself crazy and find dots that aren't there. Like right. sometimes a filmmaker just does a project because the money's there, they have to do it, that's great. And you can convince yourself there's some sort of, you know, well, I think the theme of this is what they were discovering. Yeah. And you can do that. But sometimes that can be fun, you know, even if it might be a bit rigid, ridiculous or, or stretching uh, stretching things a bit thin, you know. So <laughs> if, if I remember right, I think I, I remember hearing that Todd Field, who put out Tar last year, he's only released like three films, and I believe he's done like a ton of commercial work in between, and that's basically it. It just makes a living doing these fun little commercials, and then every once in a while, oh, I'll just randomly make a, a masterpiece, basically. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Glazer as well, uh, yeah. who made Under the Skin, and uh, yeah, he makes a lot of commercials, and I think I think I, it was an interview with Tony Scott where he said what was great about commercials making them was you get given a lot of money to make things look good. So you can experiment with big budgets and technology that you can then bring to your future projects. Yeah. And, uh, when you you think about that with his work, it's like, okay, that kind of makes sense. I, I can see that, you know? So you don't get play money when you're making a blockbuster. (laughs) <laughs> yeah you gotta, you yeah, gotta exactly. save money <laughs> yeah yeah exactly well put yeah that's fun um yeah I, I completely see that for a lot of these people and i could see if somebody could give the time to some sort of uh i don't know a revival of of music video discs i i, I feel like that'd be really fun to get a handful of essays on some of these but i, I imagine the rights entanglement there would be a nightmare to, to get everything together yeah, and also one thing that really uh, frustrates me is I, I'd love to see gorgeous, digitally remastered copies of these videos from yeah. Film Elements. You know, uh, I mean, they did it. I mean, I, 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 I knew this was something unusual, and then I realized why. Recently, they premiered uh, a couple of years ago in Cannes uh, a, a gorgeous 4K restoration of the I. I I'm still standing video by Elton John. And I thought, wow, that's really unusual to take that step, to go back to the film elements. Then, of course, I discovered that um, in the biopic of, is it, is it called Rocket Man? The yeah. biopic about Elton John? Yeah. The whole end sequence is a recreation of that video where they slot in footage from yeah. the from the original music video so that's why there was a 4k scan done, you know um but and unfortunately because of that's it was great that that video happened but usually it's few and far between what i've started seeing recently is uh new remastered versions are actually just uh, ai treated to kind of make them mm-hmm. a bit softer and sharper and uh you know they can just look a bit messy so yeah I had heard, and I'm not sure if this is accurate, so hopefully people don't excoriate me in the comments, but uh, I believe Thriller uh, from Michael Jackson, the whole short 15 minute or whatever it was, got an actual like full 4K restoration. And I believe now you can see it on iTunes in 4K, digital 4K, of course. But I've been hoping and dreaming that something gets announced in the next couple of years where there's either you know some random documentary on michael jackson or just a collection of something and we get an actual uhd of thriller that would be mind-blowing to see nowadays yeah i agree yeah no i mean i mean i remember when that video came remember when the video came out as, as in i don't mean the music video on tv but remember there was like a sell-through video yeah that used to be everywhere and it was so oh, popular yeah. you know and i i have at home what i believe was the first video single which is the human league where wow. they did they did a three music video video but the problem was back then this was 83 84 the cost of the of that video tape was 9 pounds 99 <laughs> which was a lot of money then so it was a great it failed experiment because it was never going to be as popular as a a single right. record or cassette or whatever but uh I love the fact that it was attempted, you know? 
it's fantastic and and it would have been great if but but the thriller video because didn't it have a making of as well afterwards yep. it was like the, the full short little three or four minute thing afterwards yeah 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 so really maximizing you know but uh but people didn't care people just wanted to watch that video over and over again anyway over so, and, yeah. and then dance <laughs> away <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that dance everybody still knows it's crazy yeah. um what what all uh like musical styles are you into nowadays because i've seen you posting about going to some live shows recently too oh the, the only live show i've been into in the last four years uh was was pulp actually <laughs> um yeah, like what music I'm I, I'm into. I got to be honest. I, I I go I go down some really weird uh, wormholes when it comes to music. Um, for example, I got really into listening to a lot. Uh, was that song Popcorn? You know that tune. I da, da, believe da, so. Da, da, yeah. Da. Yeah, and out of the blue, that just came up, and then. It was funny. What started happening was I, I had a YouTube uh, playlist created of the different music I've been listening to. And it was literally going from all these different decades. So it went from a disco tune to a new wave tune to something from the 90s to then something back from the 60s. It was just jumping around the place. Right. So I have these kind of random... There's a musician, uh, an Irish musician called Keeley who, um, uh, well, that's that's the name of the band. It's also the first name of the singer. But um, she just did her debut album recently. So I've been listening to that, actually. That's quite good. I like that album. Uh, so that's the most recent thing. But, uh, yeah, partially because, uh, well, partially because I have kids and just getting out of the house, it, <laughs> you know, is difficult, as, as you know yourself. Um, yep. But uh, but also with the pandemic and things. But I... I really want to start getting back to gigs again. <laughs> I Me hope too. so too. I mean, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the most amazing, it's a, it's a film related gig, but back in goodness, I'm trying to remember when, when it was, was it 2017, 2000, it must've been 2017 maybe, uh, in, or maybe 2016 even in, uh, Ireland, John Carpenter played, uh... you know, and it was one of these evenings where, if, and I, I went up to Dublin for it, so I'm down in Cork, going up to Dublin, and every second person we were bumping into was, "Hi, Chris," because <laughs> it was all the, <laughs> all the films, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know, because um, you know, besides doing my own stuff, I, I used to sometimes for Horrorthon, this film festival, the horror film festival that my friend Ed King uh, organizes at the Irish Film Institute every year. I used to do Q and As, and sometimes for that, you know, like I once did a, an on stage. Uh, talk with uh, clive barker wow. um i just but it was just one of those things where it was so wow that's clive barker wow that's right. clive barker i can't remember one single thing i said to him nor one single thing he said back to me i just really <laughs> yep. wish it was recorded because it was just you know i got to keep this going and i'm ready to jump on the next question and all this stuff you know but um sorry i didn't mean to go off on a tangent there but it was just Please uh, do. uh yeah no it was just um that was, the, that was anyway that was a great music evening but yeah doing the q and a's and things that can be that can be fun i did a q and a with abel ferrara which uh which is which was an experience uh <laughs> wonderful i really enjoyed it at one point they you know because the way you can be uh right the programmer told me afterwards one of the programs at the ifi said at one point i went Oh, poor Chris! I'm going to jump in now and say the Q and A's finished for the night. Thanks, but then I came back with, a, you know, back to Ferrari with a curveball where I right. was able to um, get it back on track. And what happened was, I said to him, because I was trying to get at that he he loves uh, one of his one of Ferrari's favorite filmmakers was Pasolini. So I was saying to him, uh, how did it feel to finally get to make your film about Pasolini? You know, so it wasn't just the question being how was it to make this film you've always wanted to make, but right. how was it to make this film about this person you idolize, admire, etc.? And Abel just went to me, it was great. <laughs> it was like eating ice cream. Like what a stupid question. You know, he just looked at me and 250 people in the audience, but then I was able to come back to, yeah, but I'm talking about you made a film about Pasolini. And then I got this wonderful answer from him. But initially he just looked at me like, it was great. Like, yeah, push back a little bit. Yeah, 
Yeah, but I think he does that anyway. That's just the way he does it, you know. That's just the way he does things. But uh, yeah, anyway, sorry, going off on tangents now, talking about Q and A's and things. But yeah, the show is <laughs> a tangent. Come on, um, I, I, I God, I'm fascinated by so much of this, and I, I want to just pull it every single string. But there's so many things. I mean, first of all, we we haven't even gotten like a, a stable background. I believe um, you you grew up uh, for a little while, at least in the UK, before going to Ireland, right? Yeah, so um, my my father's my father's English, my mother's Irish, and I spent the first ten years of my life. Uh, well, I was born in Holland to make it more in the Netherlands to make it more confusing. Um, then, like three months old, moved back to the UK, and I lived in Cornwall. My father was from a town called Falmouth, and Falmouth was is I should say we were based uh, thirty miles away from where they filmed Straw Dogs. Ah, so. Um, and it was really fascinating because, like, I, I, like my grandmother, for example, who passed away a few years ago, uh, she the last film she ever saw in the cinema was the ori- probably the original release of Lawrence of Arabia in the sixties. You know, she just wasn't into film, right? But she could tell you, oh, Straw Dogs with Dustin Hoffman because it was such a local celebrity yeah. film, you know. And you'd bump into people who would mention, oh, Straw Dogs, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I so I was there till ten. Then my parents moved to rural Ireland, a place called uh, Kerry, a town called Kemair and Kerry. So I was there for about eight years. And then from there, uh, I moved to Cork. And even though I've kind of moved around since I've been in Cork, like I, I lived in New York briefly, I lived in Toronto for a while, I lived in London. Wow. During that time, Cork was always my, my base. Right. So I always kind of came back to Cork. And, and, my, and my wife's from Cork. So. Um, you know, like about 13, 12, 13 years ago, when things got really bad here and people were leaving Ireland to look for employment, there was me going back to Ireland to to look for employment. And I ended up getting my, my job where I'm currently programming a cinema in, in, in Ireland, the Triscoll Art Centre. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, so a lot of bouncing around, a lot of that's why my accent might be a bit, a bit unusual. It's not irish but there might be certain phrases i say that might sound irish but it's not exactly west country maybe a bit mockney i don't know because i because it was like one thing my father used to try to do was try to get me to stop sounding incredibly cornish you know so west country accent would sound a bit more like this and my father would be like let's go out together and my father would be like no say together so it was kind of ingrained into me to try to uh you know just not sound like I was from the West country necessarily or whatever, just, you know, so my accent's a bit all over the place. So, uh, yeah. So that, that, you know, um, that, that's my geographical background anyway. <laughs> maybe, maybe those, uh, three months in Holland are really flavoring the accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we heard about Cork being the, the home base. What about the film home base? Is there certain things, obviously, as you branch out towards all these other genres, is there a handful of things that you always go back to and you find yourself really drawn to? Uh, nothing in particular. What I mean by that is is I bounce around so much and I can get so interested in particular films or filmmakers or actors there are certain people i always go back to i've always loved and i'll always go back to you know like nicholas rogue as i mentioned already uh brian de palma lynn ramsey lynn ramsey's like my my favorite contemporary filmmaker i'm a huge fan of hers and that's why yeah. working on the morbid color disc was such a um important thing for me um Rob Zombie as well. I'm a big fan of Rob Zombie. I, I I find it fascinating how much people either love him or hate him. That was an uh, unexpected like, answer. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, I mean, I think Lords of Salem and uh, Halloween Thank 1 and 2. Are, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I host the Irish premiere of Lords of Salem. Wow. Uh, in my current cinema program, which is, an old, which is a former church space. So to see Lords of Salem in this wooden cinema of old pews and things. It was, it was quite something, you know, it was a full house as well. It was really quite something. Um, 
it's a special movie. I'm a big fan of that movie. But also, I, I think uh, Halloween 1 and 2 really hit me hard as well. I saw the second one again recently, and it's... Uh, oh, bloody hell. It's hard. It's 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 harrowing stuff, I think, you know? I, I really like... I'm really a big fan of his work. Me too. Even it, the it monsters is... recently. Sorry. I still haven't gotten to the monsters yet. You're good. You're good. Keep on going. I, I just... Halloween 2 is so much better than people give it credit for. Yeah, I mean, I, I do admit that the director's cut works better than the theatrical cut because yep. they, there was some compromises made. Um, and the first time I saw it, the theatrical cut, I was underwhelmed by it. But when I went back to it a little while later, I, I absolutely loved it. And I really found it um, uh, emotionally draining, you know, uh, like the the performances in that film, the, the characters, uh and also, I, I find a lot of his dialogue amusing as well. You know, just just some of his characterizations and things. Yeah. So, um, and it's weird, like, and it's strange. I'm talking about. I'm mean, also like Claire Denis would be another director. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, and you know, there's a lot of modern directors. There's a lot of modern directors I liked as well. I'm just, I'm blanking right now. Uh, cause I keep going back to the, <laughs> to, it's funny cause I'm so invested in thinking about older films because those are the projects I tend to get offered right, for video essays. Right. I tend to linger in that world when I'm talking in these conversations, you know, but then when I'm in my film programming world, it's all contemporary with the occasional, uh, going back to older movies or special programs right. or seasons or something, you know? Well, I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's a really good segue into a common theme that seems to be over the internet uh, for a lot of these, uh, not to put them down, but like kind of film pretentious circles lately is there, there are tons of people that will simply say they don't watch anything in the 21st century, or they don't see how anybody's going to the cinema for any film nowadays. Um, are, are there any, uh, you know, films from the last five or eight years that are uh, just masterpieces in your mind? Something that if somebody's really staying away from something in the 21st century that you would say, how have you not seen X? And not the film X there, although that was not intentional. Yeah. <laughs> um, God, quick question. You put me on the spot now. I am. Uh, well, As a film programmer, goal. you got to be ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. No, do you know what it is? It's, it's. I'll, I'll come up with some titles in a second. What it is is, ever since the pandemic, I just find I've, I've kind of slightly lost um, same touch of time a little bit, and it just seems like this big discourse between different things, you know, um, or distance, I should say. Well, well, first of all, before I answer the question with some titles, I think it's really interesting that that people get have that opinion. And I understand why, because filmmaking and the cinema going experience are not necessarily worse for me, but they're different to what it Absolutely. used to be. And I think that's what's the, that's the thing when you grow up with something and it's a certain way and then it's suddenly different. Right. Uh, and also as you get older, you know, for example, I'm not a fan of superhero movies, the Marvel, DC comic movies, whatever. However, I would never um, dismiss them, even though I'm not a fan of them, I would never dismiss them, because that's the same thing that people were doing in the early 80s with slasher films. Exactly. You know, so I enjoy slasher movies from that era and things, and if I was the, the age now, the right age now for the comic book movies, maybe that would be those would be my slasher movies. Right. Do you know what I mean? So sense. it's very important not to to kind of do that. But in terms of recent years, films that um, I really, really liked, I'm thinking recently, uh, the last couple of films that Yurtsi Skolomowski made, I'm sorry, I know we're talking about modern cinema, but it's, it's, it's an older filmmaker, obviously, but we're talking about yeah. modern cinema. Um, like uh, his recent film, EO, or uh, a film we made about 10 years ago called 11 Minutes. Yeah. I thought they were absolutely amazing. And it's a, and it's fascinating to see an older filmmaker working with modern materials. Does that make any sense? Absolutely, yeah. Like working with digital, working with modern means, and it not feeling old, you know? See how these um, people adapt, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
and uh, you know cl- some of Claire Denis' recent films. Uh, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it, which, which was the film, the, the science fiction one with uh, Robert Pattinson. Uh, High Life. High Life. Yeah. Yeah. High Life. I mean, High Life was great. Yeah. You know, and um, I just wish I could think of some more. Oh, well, actually, there is a recent. Uh, more contemporary younger filmmaker whose uh f- film i really liked and uh that film is after blue mm. uh bertrand mandico i think i pronounced his name right maybe not but um there's a company called anti-world are you, fa- have you are you familiar with the anti-world titles anti-world's titles Man, you, it, this is gonna sound like we planned this i swear to everybody watching we did not literally last night uh on my i do a weekly show where i talk about all the announcements and we talked about surrealist films last night and bertrand mm-hmm. mandico came up and we, we talked about him for a handful of minutes uh but also i do a newsletter for my patrons every month and i just literally right before coming down here was getting up uh for the one that's coming out this weekend and i just put up this big banner for anti worlds i love their stuff they they don't get nearly enough play but i've been talking about them for a long time well uh me and uh a, f- a good friend of mine maximilian lecane who's another f- uh, fellow experimental filmmaker we're collaborating on a video essay for the upcoming uh uk blu-ray release of anti uh, of from from anti worlds of after blue wow. so um so yeah, so I'm allowed to. I'm allowed to reveal that. <laughs> I double checked. Very nice. So um, I got a couple of different iron, irons in the in the fire, which I can't reveal now, awesome. whatever. But uh, but that one I can. But yeah, that film was I was really impressed by. Um, uh, but anti anti worlds do some amazing films. Oh yeah, uh, the, the earwig uh, is the is the recent, which is the one that's upcoming. Yeah. that's a ama- you know that's an amazing movie. That and uh, Murder Me Monster. I was really looking forward to Murder Me Monster. Yeah, I haven't seen that myself yet. I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah. And, um, oh, I mean, they've done some great stuff. I mean, they did that great documentary about, um, oh, artist Penny Penny Slinger. Yep. Did you see that documentary? Yeah. yeah. That was a good documentary. We showed that. It was, I think we were the only art cinema in Ireland that showed it. <laughs> yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, obviously... It, hard sell or whatever but i when i can i like to try to support them uh but yeah that's uh but uh, yeah after after blue was a film i really liked so yeah. um yeah so i'm just blanking i wish i could remember more titles it's just <laughs> uh i was so i was so geared up in talking about older movies and right <laughs> you know, i had to throw the curveball and I, I totally get it i i keep joking that it feels like it's march 914th of 2020 just because time stood still for this longest time. And the weirdest thing is the world does keep spinning, obviously. I mean, my, my children have gotten a lot older. I've gotten a lot older in the last three years. But at the same time, so many things are still stuck fighting that same fight. I mean, we, we talked about media manipulation earlier. And the fact that this is a daily thing in our lives that we're literally fighting against, you know, global conglomerates and trying to uh, you know, as of yesterday, we see the Screen Actors Guild going on strike. There, there are so many labor things that everybody's facing right now that has not changed in three years. And it's depressing, but it, it makes it feel like this odd, stagnant time. Yeah, and it, and it kind of feels like, like politically things, like the last five, six, seven years between like Brexit happening in the UK, uh, different... Um, should we say political leaders in different countries? Uh, COVID yeah. <laughs> and uh, and then just so many and, and then what's happening in the Ukraine and yeah. every it just feels like we're being uh, pelted with things at the moment, you know. And and then when one thing starts to kind of ease up, another thing starts happening. Like what's happening with the with the you know the Writers Guild and the Actors Guild. Um, and uh you know the environment and everything it just feels like everything in the last couple of years just pelting us at the same time just when we think we're we're over one thing something else comes up you know oh and by the way the food you need to survive costs twice as much now too yeah yeah exactly (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's been a rough time and i hope that we find a way out of it and one of the things that i use to get out of it is cinema so uh, to wrap it up, thank you for your contributions and for giving a lot of us a, a, an escape and 
36 plus visual essays that have been astounding. Uh, I will link to some of my favorites in the description below. Everybody, please go support Chris. Uh, again, his Vimeo is going to be down there. Lots of great stuff to check out. Uh, Chris is fantastic. Give him a follow on social media. Thank you for doing this. Oh, well, thanks for thanks for having me. This was fun, and uh, I'm sure there's a million other things we could have discussed. As in, it was it was fun uh, doing so. And um, yeah, thanks thanks for asking me to be on your show. I will absolutely be asking again because we have a lot of the same interests and there's a lot more rabbit <laughs> little trails that we can go down, I'm sure. All right, Chris, uh, be safe. Have a good night. and We'll talk again soon. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to the Disconnected Podcast. There's one big thing that you could do to help the show, and that is to leave a rating and review on the podcast service of your choice. Thank you.